This video is designed to provide information to fitness and wellness professionals about how to serve customers and participants with disabilities. It was developed under a New York State Developmental Disabilities Planning Council Inclusive Fitness Initiative grant. This grant was awarded in order to address the significant health disparities between adults with and without disabilities and create more opportunities for individuals with developmental and other disabilities to participate in inclusive fitness and wellness programming. Over the course of the three-year project, we discovered that different people have different definitions for the term inclusion. In terms of our work under this initiative, inclusive programming is defined as providing the opportunity for individuals with disabilities to participate in typical community-based programs and services alongside their peers without disabilities as equals. This requires that fitness professionals be prepared for and intentional about including all customers and potential customers with disabilities. Everyone should have an equal opportunity to participate in your programs and services. Let's get started with a brief overview of what the Train the Trainer program is all about. It is a um, inclusive fitness continuing education course for fitness and wellness trainers. So the whole idea is to try and provide them with some education so that they can go back to the facilities that they work at or the agencies that they work at and try to encourage more inclusive fitness um, for individuals with and without disabilities. So today, for example, some of the, um, some of the subject matter is uh, disability awareness, um, universal design for your facility, then modifications of exercises, uh, a module on uh, stress management and yoga, and then we finish up with um, a module on kind of how to, how to promote and market to individuals with disabilities. If you take it kind of from my background as a physical therapist, so I work with folks, everybody that comes to me comes to me with some kind of disability and we're trying to improve that. Usually it's a physical disability, but it, it can be emotional as, as well as um, mental health issues. But the bottom line is I can only see them for a short period of time for insurance sake. And then after that, we always try, it's really important to encourage movement and fitness because it has such far reaching advantages to getting off of medications and getting onto you know, a healthier lifestyle. Yes, they might be able to get a membership in a health club, but is that health club accessible to them? Are there staff members that are sensitive to the, the special needs that somebody might have who is using a wheelchair, for example, to get around that gym versus coming in without having to have any, you know, any mobility. Dr. Diane Ryan, who is the other person on the grant, so she and I, her background is nurse practitioner, so she and I kind of um, took the approach that, you know, we're both educators, so we think that education is really the way to go. So if you can educate people on the importance of this, and then they can go back to their facilities and make modifications to programs they already have. So what, basically what we're trying to say is you already have something marketable in place. If you just tweak it a little bit, by being sensitive to, to maybe the space that you have and making it more accessible. Or you know, maybe it's a function of how you market it to individuals, making sure that your website is welcoming to people with different disabilities. So just making small changes that can also increase the, the number of folks that come through your door. You know, if that's what you're trying to do is to promote new programs, this is one way. And there's a lot of, um, also, if I think you make yourself more welcoming to people with disabilities, their families are more than, more than happy to accompany them, so that might increase the number of folks through your door as well. The video has three modules, each addressing key issues related to the inclusion of people with disabilities. The first module includes information about how individuals with disabilities have been viewed throughout history and offers tips for interacting with people with different types of disabilities. Module 2 explains the principles of universal design, 
that enable a space or program to be used by a broad range of people of different ages, ability, sizes, etc. And the final module describes some disability-related considerations for working with individuals with developmental and other disabilities, and includes demonstrations of exercise equipment and modifications. Each module includes reflection and discussion questions that can be considered by an individual or as a group activity. If you are able to view the whole video at one time, great. If not, the modules stand alone and can be viewed separately. As a fitness professional, you can help to address the need to provide individuals with disabilities ways to become more active, maintain functionality, and ward off secondary health conditions. We hope this video will give you some new ideas about how to serve customers who have or may acquire disability. More information about Damon's continued inclusive fitness efforts will be provided at the conclusion of the video. You're going to learn more about the history of developmental disabilities, what developmental disabilities are, person-first language, and how to make some adaptions in your jobs when you're working with people with developmental disabilities with exercise programs. So serving participants with disabilities. So the, the goals of this module is to provide an overview of how disabilities have been viewed over time, consider how language influences beliefs about people with disabilities, and discuss um, how to effectively interact with people with disabilities. The first thing I want you just to think about, you don't have to say anything out loud, is what is the first word or phrase that comes to your mind when you hear the term disability? So often the biggest barrier is not the disability, but it's people's attitudes about others. And attitudes are based on fears and misinformation and are often the biggest challenge faced for individuals with disabilities. Let's take a look at some of the ways in which people with disabilities have been viewed throughout history. So the moral model, um, disability means God is displeased. And this model was predominant in the 1700s and early 1800s. It was based on a religious belief that if you were physically or mentally different in any way, that you were morally flawed in the eyes of God. So in the mid 1700s, young men and women who wanted to enter clergy were inspected from head to toe to ensure that their bodies were not flawed. In a flawed body, it was felt um, that you were tantamount to a flawed soul and seeing that the message from God is that he was displeased from you. Then we have the medical model, and that is a disability must be cured. And this is the science-based model and views of disability as a genetic defect that must be fixed. So this model was in the mid 1800s and the view shifted slightly from the religious based um, model to one of the medical and science. And here, this is a picture of Charles Dickinson's Tiny Tim. And when people hear Tiny Tim, they see the person as um, a crippled, in the picture, you know, he used um, crutches or a cane. So in some words, um, people looked at him as helpless, a poor little boy. Um, he was an object of pity. Then we have the rehabilitation model. And this was during World War I. Many young men and women returned from battle on the field with a range of disabilities, chemical burns, amputations, disease-based disabilities, and psychiatric disorders. Seeing that their own family members and neighbors were returning 
from the war and a range of disabilities made it difficult um, for people with disabilities as being seen as now medically unfit or the religious model that they were flawed by God. The re rehabilitation movement began as we tried to help veterans with disabilities return back into society into a normal work life. And seeing these veterans with disabilities is less than human or inferior wasn't acceptable anymore. Then we have the civil rights minority model, and this was during the 1960s. People of color and women struggled for their civil rights, and people with disabilities also began to form a stronger sense of identity as a minority group and gain awareness of themselves as a group subject to discrimination and oppression like other minorities. And this led the shift away from tenets of the rehabilitation movement. The purpose of the rehabilitation is to support the individual to function in society the same ways that you and I function in society despite what their disability is. And then we come to the social construction model. The model embraces a more current philosophy that attitude is the real disability. People with disabilities began to put forth the idea that often the biggest barrier was not the disability itself, but the barriers created by society that prevented the full and equal participation of individuals with disabilities. It is the attitudes of society and environment barriers that prevent people with disabilities um, from becoming full members of society. Disability has gone from being a condition that must be overcome in one's life expectancy, and the model focuses on the role of society in gaining equality for all its citizens, including people with disabilities, without them being seen as special. So within this model, society has the responsibility to address the barriers that prevent the participation of people with disabilities. And the focus shifts from fixing a person with a disability um, and helping them overcome the barriers. So interacting with people with disabilities. How many people currently work um, with someone who has a developmental disability or has someone in their life that has a developmental disability? Two, okay. So a lot of times um, when people first um, work with someone with a developmental disability or find out that a family member uh, has been born with a developmental disability. We have the empathy versus sympathy. So if you think about um, our world, we never want to have sympathy for anyone that is different than us, um, anybody, any person with a developmental disability, but we want to have that empathy. So disability has historically been viewed as a negative and individuals with disabilities as objects. Um, in other words, people with disabilities have been viewed more so with sympathy throughout our time. And sympathy implies that you recognize someone else's suffering, while em empathy implies that you can relate to the difficulties that they face. And we, we may not all have disabilities, but the majority of us have challenges in our life that we must address in creative ways. And this fact is the foundation for empathy rather than sympathy. Another way to look at the difference between these concepts is that sympathy comes from sadness or guilt that we feel about the individual situation, while empathy recognizes challenges as part of the experience of just being human. So we also have the disability first language which draws attention to the limitation or weakness one person may have 
and it defines the person by their disability and, a, and draws to stereotypes. If you use the person first language, you're emphasizing the person, you describe the person and not their condition, and it draws attention to the unique individual. Here are some examples of the person first language. So the derogatory term would be um, handicapped. Instead, we wanna say a person with a disability. A blind person, we wanna say a person who is blind. A deaf person, a person who is deaf. Mute, a person without speech. Um, retard or feeble-minded. We want to say a person with developmental disabilities. About 15 years ago, there was a movement in New York State um, to stop the R word. Um, so it's like a big kibosh to use mentally retarded now in the field. We always want to refer to someone that is different than us, that has intellectual challenges as an intellectual disability or a person with a developmental disability. We also have a birth defect. Instead of saying someone has a birth de defect, they have a con congenital disability. Um, we never want to say that one person is confined to a wheelchair, but they use a wheelchair to assist them to get around. Uh, crazy or insane, is, we refer to as a person with a, health dis a mental health disability. So, the best thing to remember using the person first language is always putting that person first. The other terms is to describe a person, just like you would say, Erica is standing at the podium, she has blonde hair, she has blue eyes, is you're gonna say who I am first and then describe. It's just a fun little uh, cartoon. Um, so how, how do you want to refer to be called handicapped, disabled, or physically challenged? And the gentleman utilizing the wheelchair is Joe. Just utilizing someone's first name is the best way. You're chuckling. It is fun. <laughs> Thank you. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping though you're, you're reaching us, and I'm hoping that you can um, somehow tap into the community at large that treats people, because I can't tell you how many uh, practitioners talk to me about my son and say MR and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, that's, it's very offensive to me. Right, right. But they don't get it. No, they don't. Not yet. Small changes, one day at a time. Yeah. So there's a variety of types of disabilities. We have physical disabilities, which is the mobility, strength, dexterity, and stamina. Sensory, which vision, hearing, and speech. And then you have non-obvious disabilities, which would be an intellectual, cognitive, psychiatric, learning or some health conditions um, such as cancer or diabetes. Um, with health conditions, it could be a temporary disability for a person depending on what they're going through at that time with their medical treatment. So physical disabilities could result from an injury or it could result from something that occurred during birth and it would be a lifelong disability. There is a difference um, with disabilities versus developmental disabilities. When you're growing and developing as a person, science says that you have fully developed with the growth internally, um, organs, everything by the age of 21. So if you have an accident or maybe you were born um, with cerebral palsy, um, or you get ill and have a high fever and you've developed epilepsy from that, um, which is a seizure disorder, or you had a stroke as a child and then maybe like 
half your side is now paralyzed, you would be considered to have a developmental disability. If you have an accident or injury after the age of 21, that um, where now you have a disability, you could have severe diabetes and bad circulation as a result and lose your foot. Um, you would just be considered to have a disability and need adaptive assistance. You could be a person that was, um, like I said, in a car accident after the age of 21 and as a result had such a severe injury that you have traumatic brain injury that would be just considered to have a disability. So the services that and assistance that you would qualify for would be different after the age of 21. And again, a lot of this is just that labeling and terminology that is used to help um, work with a person versus just labeling a person for the sake of labeling people. So interacting with people with disabilities. You have a visitor come to your facility who looks fine and ask for help in reading the group fitness schedule. What should you do? help them read it. Should we ever assume by looking at a person that they can read the schedule and should know how to do it, right? So many disabilities are not obvious. So if a person requests that help, we should offer our help. You don't understand what someone with a speech or hearing disability has said. What should you do? Speak much louder, pretend to understand so you don't hurt their feelings, or say you don't understand and keep trying to communicate. C. And also it, it may be A and C, um, depending on how you, your voice is. Um, some people tend to talk very softly and that's just their nature. So you wanna be aware of that and just bring your tone up an octave, not yelling, but just bring it up a little bit louder. We never need to yell to communicate, um, but we just wanna you know, speak a little bit louder, make sure that we have good eye contact, make sure that we're facing the person, we're not looking down when we're talking to someone who, um, has a speech or hearing disability. And sometimes we may want to get some paper and a pen and write something down to help the person as well. So just some general considerations when working with a person with developmental disabilities is relax. Be yourself. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Treat adults as adults and use the person first language. Offer assistance and if accepted, follow the person's lead. And with offer assistance, we never want to assume that someone can open the door or can't open the door, um, can tie their shoes or can't tie their shoes. But if you see someone in the gym where you work and notice that someone is struggling, ask if they want the assistance first. And if they say yes, then provide the assistance. Address the person directly and not their companion or interpreter. A lot of times you'll find, um, you know, some people with developmental disabilities may have a sign language interpreter with them. They may have a guide with them. They may have a staff person that works with them to help them. You never want to address their assistant person working with them. You always want to have that direct eye contact with the person that you're working with. You don't want to ask a question to someone else, but you're working with this person. 
and I've seen that a lot over my career and they're waiting for me to respond and I just sit there and wait till they realize they should be talking to the person I'm with versus waiting for my answer. Remember, the same disability can affect um, different people in different ways. Treat every person as an individual. Consider the whole person. Um, they're intersecting identities in all aspects of their lives and not just the disability. So to effectively um, interact with people with disability, is based on respect. Respect the person that you're working with. Have the open communication with the person. Ask questions of if you're working with someone um, and you're assisting them to learn how to use some equipment at the gym. Ask the questions. How can I better assist you? What do you need help with? Don't be afraid to ask questions just like you would anybody else because we're all the same people. So just a little uh, scenario for you guys to think about. Pat is a woman who uses a wheelchair for mobility. She has registered for a Zumba class. She requests the following accommodations. Would you provide them? An automatic door opener for the fitness room. An electrical door opener. Right. So, what they what it is is, it's not required by law. However, the pull force of the interior door can be adjusted to better assist someone with opening the door, or if you know, um, so it should be no more than five pounds to open a door. There's um, also, if you know Pat is coming for her class every morning at 9 a.m. and she re re arrives around 8.55 a.m., just that great customer service of having someone there who can see her coming in and open the door for her. The other participants, um, she has requested that other people not stand in front of her during class. Would you accommodate or would you not? You know, honestly, having not in a position like this and not, um, not necessarily a person in a wheelchair, um, it would be better for her to actually be in the back of the room so she doesn't trip anyone. Um, for her to be in the front, she's going to be distracting me and um, probably the people around her. And I don't think that that's a good spot for her. Okay. So I probably would ask her, you know, have her maybe be on the side. Maybe she's closer to the front, but right in front, it, it, that's a problematic spot with a wheelchair.
and then help with showering after class. No, no, yep. So Title II and Title III entities of the ADA um, entitles that we make must make reasonable accommodations, but they're not required for anyone to assist a person in the shower. Um, she may need help putting things into the shower, like her towels, soap, that kind of stuff. Obviously, we can assist with that, but we should never, we're not required by law to help someone physically shower. Hello and welcome. This PowerPoint presentation was created by Dr. Margaret Mazone from the Physical Therapy Department at Damon College. I'm Teresa Kowache and I'll be highlighting concepts and key issues when it comes to incorporating universal design for your fitness facilities. So as far as the introduction goes, I'm gonna start with just um, some facilitators and challenges to exercise for people with disabilities. Then we'll move on to universal design. And then um, to give you some ideas about the um, definition of such, and then we'll move into applying the universal design to fitness environments. All right, so if you look at the research, they show that um, there are certain things that facilitate participation in exercise um, programs for people with disabilities. And these include things like the physical environment. So um, really how your facility is laid out, what, um, the lighting, how clean is the environment, how inviting is the environment, for example. And then equipment, if the equipment is high tech, shiny, new, all those sorts of things. Um, attitudes, we mean of the staff towards people with disabilities, um, making sure that it's engaging and fun activities. So making sure activities are interesting and, and fun to encourage participation. And then opportunities for socialization. We all know the research that's out there that talks about how much more um, interesting and fun it is when you're exercising with other individuals. And then finally, the individual's own perception of the benefits of exercise. So um, for them to have the knowledge that it's a good thing to increase their fitness levels. Now, of course, the flip side of that would be challenges. So challenges are really detractors for people with disability engaging in physical activity. And so um, if they don't feel welcome in the environment, they're not gonna attend your sessions, right? Individuals, family and friends really play an, play an important role in motivating the individual to stay active. So really how accessible are your facilities? Would somebody with a wheelchair um, be able to move freely throughout your facility? Um, is the staff properly educated um, to allow for the changes that are necessary for people um, with disabilities if they need any accommodations? And then people with disabilities, their own um, knowledge of their body and what really the disability allows them to do. Is the equipment easy to access and manipulate? Um, how about the cost? That's always an issue for some. So the cost of membership might be a deterrent. And are they um, healthy enough to participate in the activities as far as their um, health status goes? Um, how motivated are they to change those habits into healthy habits? And then finally, when it comes to transportation, so are they able to get themselves to your facility independently? Do they need a wheelchair van to get them there? Family members take them there? So all these things might be considered challenges. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about what universal design is. So the concept of designing all products and the built environment to be aesthetic and usable to the greatest extent possible for anyone, regardless of their age, their ability, or really their stages in life. So the design and composition, so for thinking about the ADA, the design and composition of um, an environment so that it can be accessed understood and used to the greatest possible extent in the most independent and natural manner um, in the widest possible range of situations and really without adaptation. All right, so there are different principles that I just want to introduce you to to kind of give you some groundwork for universal design. 
So uh, the first one is equitable use. So the design is useful and marketable to people with diverse ability. So we want to provide the same means of use for all users, identical whenever possible, and e um, equitable or equivalent when not possible. And the second piece talks about flexibility in use. So design accommodates a wide range of individual preferences and abilities. So we want to provide choice in the method of use. So an, uh, you know, an example of that might be an accommodation for right-handed or left-handed access to a piece of equipment. Another principle talks about simple and intuitive use. So make it easy to understand regardless of the user's experience or their knowledge, their language skills, those sorts of things. So we elimin eliminate any unnecessary uh, complexity. So accommodate a wide range of literacy and language skills, for example. This next po uh, point talks about perceptible information. So we wanna design, um, have a design that communicates necessary information that's um, effectively to the uh, to the user. So we want to make sure that we use different modes. For example, if we're giving instructions, um, pictorial, verbal, or tactile mode um, for redundant presentation of that essential information. All right, the next principle talks about um, tolerance of error. So we want to kind of minimize. So we want to make sure our design minimizes any kind of hazard, hazards or the adverse consequences of a, an unintended um, action from using that piece of equipment. So trying to provide a, a fail safe feature there. Um, talking about low physical effort, even though we're trying to increase their physical health, so to speak, we want to have um, a design that can be used efficiently, comfortably, and with minimum fatigue. So we want to allow the user to maintain things like neutral body position, which would assist with that process. All right, the last one talks about size and space for approach and use. So um, approaching the piece of equipment, using the piece of equipment, so that it's a, we have appropriate size and space to provide easy approach, easy reach, manipulation, and use regardless of um, the individual's body size, their posture, or their mobility. So we want to provide a clear line of sight for somebody who's seated or standing. We want to make sure um, that the reach to all the components for somebody who's seated or standing. We want to provide adequate space for the use of assistive device or if they need a, a personal assistance. Then just kind of thinking about how accessible your facilities are. So thinking about the entrance, you know, the way people get in and the way that they get out, is that easily accessible um, to individuals of different mobility or different sensory um, issues? So we think about the front desk. So is the front desk so high that an individual who's using a wheelchair isn't going to be able to check in those sorts of things? What their locker room bathroom and showers are like, and then even that exercise area, which we'll get into in a minute. And I mean, there's differences between what's ADA compliant and what's really accessible and useful. So you want to keep those in mind. All right. So thinking about universal design and how it's linked to the environment, thinking about that equitable and, and flexibility there. So all these are these kinds of equipment easy to access and use. And could they be accessed and used in a, by a variety of individuals, regardless of their physical limitations? So just taking a look at the different kinds of benches that you'll see around in fitness facilities. So is one of these more um, user friendly, so to speak, um, easier to access, you know, based on your body type, all those sorts of things. So you, you want to keep those things in mind when you're especially if you're going to be buying new equipment. All right, then just kind of thinking about floor space. So look at your floor space or try to visualize your floor space or if possible, maybe there are some blueprints that show your floor space. And is it equitable for use by all individuals? Can an individual reach the equipment from either side? And then kind of take a look at the organization and the accessibility of the equipment. So um, is an individual able to, if they're setting up for 
for a fitness class that's going to happen in a little while and they're going to be utilizing the therapy balls or going to be utilizing some benches and things. Are those going to be easily accessible to, um, to all individuals? You want to think about where you're going to be placing that equipment. And then, once again, talking about size and space for that approach to that piece of equipment or using that piece of equipment. So once again, we're going to take a look at so some principles here. So um, you need a five-foot turning radius for an individual who's going to be using, utilizing a wheelchair in the facility. Um, and then there should be at least 36 inches width between pieces of equipment just for easy access. Um, accessibility from the left or right side of the piece of equipment for some of our individuals that it's easier for them um, to manipulate towards one side versus the other. And then benches and steps for access and rest. So um, if they're you know fatigued and they would like a bench there so that they could take a rest in between sessions. All right, so then thinking about cardiac equipment, I know lots of facilities have a ton of cardiac equipment and usually in a confined space. So you just want to kind of look to see the environment that you have and what that space is like and if there's opportunities for you to maybe move some equipment around or at least part of it around so it will be easier to access by somebody who maybe needs a little more space. And then if we just take a look at this photograph, here's an example of size and space considerations for a person who's using a wheelchair for mobility. So the environment gives ample space for the transfer to the bench. And then once the person's there, they can reach the other equipment um, that they need uh, for their work out there. So whether it's the, the barbells or those sorts of things. All right, then just talking about sim making things simple and intuitive. Uh, when it comes to the perceptible information. So you want to make sure that the instructions are, are simple and intuitive. So this instruction plate has way too much information on there. It's too complicated and it's not really a good clear example of, of what's going on here for the, this piece of equipment. So you want to keep things like um, recommendations uh, for use when you're thinking about those instructions, you want to make sure that they're easy to read. So the font should be large enough so it's easy to read. I don't need to pull out my reading glasses, for example. Clear pictures, that there should be a start and an end position. So a photograph of start and end so individuals will know where they start, where they're going to end up. Discuss both the setup and the form. So you know where the seat height should be, um, what their posture should be like, and then precise and concise directions. So keep it as simple as possible. All right, so here's a better example. So an individual who'd be looking at this will be able to see what the starting position is like, what the mid position, the end position is like. Good photographs, very concise um, directions. All right, and so there are my references. So I thank you for your time and I wish you luck and moving on to the next session. I'm, I'm a physical therapist. I have um, been working, when did I graduate? Over 25 years experience. Um, the primary focus of my job has been pediatrics and geriatrics. I've ran pediatric exercise programs. I've ran geriatric exercise programs. I developed a fall prevention program for one of the insurance agencies in the area. And I've done balance retraining programs for some of the insurance agencies in the area. We're going to be talking about different ways to do modifications of exercises for people with disabilities and special things we might need to take into consideration. So of course, when we think function, we need to take all these things into consideration and it sounds like we're already touching on them. So we need to consider what strength are we starting with, what strength is capable for, for the uh, person we're working with, how is their current endurance, what is their cardiovascular fitness level, 
What is their flexibility? What is their current function? And what is their posture? Another big thing that, that I like to consider that I think sometimes gets lost is the posture. If we're not constantly monitoring posture and constantly making sure they're in the best available posture, everything else is kind of for naught. We're not gonna be working muscles appropriately. We're not gonna be gaining appropriate range of motion. And it's all gonna be one big domino effect. We wanna impact posture so we can impact strength and range of motion. And then that in turn is gonna help with our endurance and our cardiovascular. And that in turn is gonna help with our posture. So we kinda of have to keep an ongoing monitoring of what's going on from that perspective. In terms of keeping it fun, specialized music, um, it, we want to offer opportunities for socialization. I always incorporate games. Games are fun for everybody. Everybody likes to play games. You, you like some of the games we've done in our activities, right, Joanne? Working into competitions, depending on your population, can be a really good thing and really get them motivated. But again, we need to consider safety and what are the possible contraindications that might be going on. So we've worked with some, um, some of our participants that they really enjoy the competition, but sometimes they take it a step too far. And they have some, <laughs> Kelly, Kelly knows what I'm talking about, and they really should not be pushing themselves as hard as they want to. Or they have some mobility issues that need to be monitored, and they're like, no, no, and, and they want to push. So knowing your population and knowing what kind of competition to have and when to push it is going to be really important. Music, I know a lot of gyms have music playing in the background. What I like to do with any of my exercise programs is I have specialized music for my population. What I will do is I will let them each day, a different member can pick what music they want to listen to so everybody gets something that they like. Or for each activity, I'll let somebody different pick what kind of music they want to listen to. So some days we, we worked out to classical music. Some days we worked out to heavy metal. Some days we worked out to, I couldn't even tell you what kind of music it was. But it motivated some of the people there, so we just kept up with it. And that gives them ownership of the program, and they're more apt to want to be an active participant. And especially for some of our developmentally challenged, that's a really key thing, making them feel like it's part of their, their own um, activity, you know, giving them that ownership. They really enjoy that, okay? And the socialization aspect is huge, too, especially if you're doing a truly inclusive fitness. So you have people of different ages, people of different abilities, giving them that opportunity to socialize. Um, in our experiences here, I think it's been great. I mean, like Joanne was saying, she is still in touch with some of our Yelp participants. So that's huge. And, and for the Yelp participants to feel that comfortable working with um, other people is, is a really nice experience for them. And you can feel free to jump in anytime you want, OK? I think I told you, one of our challenge students, instead of exercising, the minute the music goes on, she starts dancing. But dancing is movement. Yeah, it's exercise. So as long as she's moving and as long as she's doing, we, we sometimes guide her a little bit in some of the movements we might, might like her to do. But she's moving, so that's great. Anything you want to add, Kelly? No? OK. You can jump in anytime you want to, OK? So some things that we may need to take into consideration. High tone, low tone, contractures cognition, and any special adaptive equipment. So do you all know what tone is? OK. Yes? We're talking about muscle tone? Yes. Yep. So high tone, this might be a group or a time where we don't want to have really high, excitatory music, depending on what we're trying to do, because that's going to have a tendency to increase the tone. If somebody, <laughs> Kelly, Kelly knows this, right? Sometimes the faster we try to move, uh, the less movement we got. Somebody that has low tone, a bright room, getting those kind of poppy, fast beat music is going to be really good because that's going to help increase their tone. And as we increase their tone, they're going to ease, it's going to ease their movement. We're going, to act, we're going to probably get more movement out of them, okay? Contractures, we need to be aware of what is available in terms of movement beforehand. 
because if we try to push a patient too far, we can cause injury. So having a really good idea of what their full mobility is before we start is going to be imperative. And then adaptive equipment. How many of you have worked with any adaptive equipment in the past? Hmm? Well, patients personalize adaptive equipment. So and ever work with anybody with even just um, AFOs or anything like that? Okay. Some things that we need to take into consideration is that some of the adaptive equipment, while it's meant to help people, sometimes often takes away too. So for example, somebody who wears AFOs or SMOs, so the leg braces, do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, some of them are just fit over the ankle, those are SMOs, some come all the way up, those are AFOs. And while they may either help with tone or they may help keep a more functional movement pattern, what happens as we wear these all the time, we actually lose strength in the muscles that it's supporting because the muscles aren't working actively. So for a lot of my patients, what I like to do is I'll do some ground, some uh, floor work and have them doing things specifically with their braces off to see how much range of motion I have, how much strength is available, and if there is a possibility that I can help improve strength without offsetting tone. The other thing you need to take into consideration when working with adaptive equipment is their, their ability to get into certain positions, to use certain equipment, and especially in a gym type situation, their ability to get in and out of some of the gym equipment. Because with AFOs, um, ankle mobility is going to be limited, so some of the equipment's not going to be appropriate for them. So those are things you really need to take into consideration. You may have people that are using assistive voice devices. Some, um, some special needs population will use uh, a PICS reference, which is the pictures that they carry around a little book or a little card that they put pictures on that tells you what they want. And then you just respond in, in kind. Some patients will use um, a Dynavox, which is it's basically a speaking tool that they wear around their neck. And they type in what they want or what their questions are. And then the computerized voice will answer you. And now there's a lot of um, iPad programs that people are using. So it's a little less cumbersome than an actual Dynavox. Okay. Wheelchairs. Any wheelchairs that you're working with? Do you get the people out of the wheelchairs or do you work with them in? I'm not a therapist, so I, that's out of my scope. The patients don't get out of the, at, at, the patients can't get out of their wheelchair on their own? Okay. That I realize, but if they are capable of getting out of their wheelchairs on their own, we want them up and out of them, okay? Allergies. How many people pay attention to allergies? Okay, latex allergies is huge, and thankfully, a lot of things are no longer made with latex, but if you're in a facility that doesn't have all newer equipment, there may be some latex available uh, it, around. And latex allergies is huge, as are peanut allergies, which a lot of people don't take into consideration. So days that I know that I'm going to be working with um, some of my special populations, I make sure there's no peanut butter anywhere in that room that day that I haven't eaten anything peanut butter because now we're finding more and more little ones are having these peanut allergies that are really severe. So you so much as breathe on somebody after you've eaten a peanut butter sandwich that day and you can throw them into an anaphylactic shock. And yeah, and that's something that a lot of people, you know, how many of us eat peanut, I love peanut butter, but we don't think about the implications of it on other people. Okay, so we have, when I'm running some of my classes, we have like a peanut free room and then a okay room. And I try to ask that information up front, but sometimes people just don't think about it. It's such a part of their life that they kind of, oh yeah, I, I do have those allergies. So sometimes we need to be very specific about what are we asking. You will find people with um, some spinal issues most specifically a, a diagnosis of spina bifida, they will have latex allergies. Almost every person I have ever worked with with a diagnosis of spina bifida has had latex allergies. Yep. So modifications, what are things that we need to do and modify? We may need to modify the equipment we're using. We may need to modify the patient's equipment. 
Um, sometimes we may need to ask for specific modifications in their prosthetics that we've talked about, and that would go through their family. We may need to adapt our language. We always want to be participant specific, and we always want to be creative with what we're doing. When I mentioned pecs before, this is an example of some of the pecs that you may see. So um, I've worked with people with various ways of using them. Some people just carry a board. Some have a card. Some have a little flip book that have all these pictures in it. And then if I need them to do something, I ask for their book, and I make the picture. I either put out the pictures or a sentence and they follow it and then they will do the same for me so really useful especially when I have when I'm working with um, younger to preteens you know for bathrooming and and snacks and breaks asking them if they need a break is going to be a key thing if you're working with a developmental disability population uh, oftentimes they're so intent on pleasing us and doing what we want and having fun, hopefully, that they forget that they need a break. You need to take a water break. You need to, to sit down and rest a minute. So I always stress with them, and I always have that break pack very readily available, that if they need a break, they need to ask for it. And if I notice that they're starting to breathe a little hard, getting a little red, I will take the break out and make them take a break. Okay. So different things, these are probably all types of equipment that you hopefully all have at your gym, right? And we're going to go through and show you how to use some of these things, maybe in ways you're already using, hopefully in some ways that you're not using them so that we can think about um, changing up our population a little bit. So anything that's in a gym, we can adapt so that just about anybody can use it, okay? I'm going to probably show you some things you may not have thought about using too. So, like I said, we want to make it functional, we want to make it fun, and we want to offer opportunities for socialization. These are some really great ways that we can do all of that. So doing more group activities, we set up obstacle courses, and we will have each participant run through it. Sometimes we'll do competitions with the obstacle courses. Simon Says is a great way to get people trying different positions and doing different things. Um, We've held aerobics classes. We've done yoga. Yoga has been very, very popular. Uh, dancing. Dancing, think about it. It works everything, right? We're working on our balance. We're working on our cardiovascular. We can be working on range of motion. I actually, I used to teach um, a physio ball exercise class. And what I did was for the physio ball, I broke down all the, Kelly won't know some of these. You probably won't know some of these, but I did like, all the old, um, I did the Macarena, I did the electric slide, we did the chicken dance, all of those sort of things, and we broke them down so that they could be done appropriately and safely on the physio ball. And it was a huge hit. And I actually had a 92-year-old little lady who was so excited because she could do the Macarena and she was going to go to her great-grandson's wedding and show everybody that she could do the Macarena. So making it fun is going to make people want to be more involved. Tai Chi is a great program from a balance perspective and a learning to control movement perspective because a lot of times what we'll see with a population that has, again, the developmental disabilities is that that motor planning and, and knowing how to move and, and knowing how to get that movement to initiate is often a tough thing. So that's where Tai Chi and yoga can be huge in helping them with that. And then aquatics. I know JCC, do all the Ys have a pool? Um, I don't know about the yellow one, but I know the Okay. Because aquatics is another great way to get people working, especially somebody who's very afraid of working out because the water is going to support you. Hopefully it's a nice therapeutic type temperature. And you can do all of these type of activities in the pool. So for somebody who has joint pain, for somebody who has a hard time initiating movement, somebody who has lower tone, this is going to be an optimal place to be working out because of the support that the water is going to give you. Okay. Any questions on anything so far? How many of you are doing anything other than like the yoga or the basic aerobic type activities? Are you doing any sort of group classes with these type of activities? What are you using? 
Um, well, I, I teach a lot of aquatics classes. Um, I, I use uh, tubing, I use balls, I use all different mm -hmm. things. So for general strengthening activities? Mostly. Okay. Mostly, yeah. A lot of you will work. Oh, yeah, in the pool, that's great, yeah. So tone, to decrease tone, doing gentle, slow movement, and it, while it's, you're not a therapist, it is well within your scope of helping people obtain an optimal postural alignment and doing slow, passive stretches. Um, having them do assistive stretching, using weights to get a slow stretch with them, assisting them in their postural alignment if they're using things like a yoga mat or a ball to enhance tone, again, bringing that upbeat music, getting on a ball and doing bouncing is going to elevate and activate their sensory level, and that's going to help make movement easier for people with low tone. The louder music, the brighter lights, all things that are going to be very tone enhancing. Yoga is going to be a really good activity for people that have higher tone because we tend to move slower. We tend to speak in that softer voice. We tend to work in a less light environment okay so working in a wheelchair if we can get them out of a wheelchair if they are capable of doing it themselves or if they have somebody there with them that can help them get them onto a mat table or even onto the floor we want to get them out so many people spend so many hours of the day in their wheelchair and that's all they do so getting and moving as much as possible out of the wheelchair is great if we can't get them out of the wheelchair, what we want to do is make sure that they are aligned properly. I have seen so many people in their normal wheelchairs that they sit in every day that are slumped or are slumped forward or they're leaning. So making sure again that we're giving them that as much postural correction as possible because that's when the stretches and the weight training is going to be most effective. Okay, so I've used noodles. I've used move and sits, I've used um, wedges, I've used pillows, every, anything, towels to get them into that more optimal alignment and get their body used to being in that position and learning what their body can do with better alignment. Because that's what a lot of it is. It's like I said, the, the motor planning is a, often an issue. So learning how to make our muscles work, learning in what um, uh, sequential firing we want, if we're not in that proper alignment, everything's going to be off. So it's going to be very different for them once we get them into that optimal alignment. And some general things that we just want to think about. Always start with a known positive. So something that is easy for the patient, something that they enjoy doing, um, start with that. So we know we're going to give them a good experience, a positive experience to start out with. If we start them out with something they're not familiar with and it's too hard or it makes them hurt too much, they're going to be less apt to want to come back and want to work with us. So starting with something that they, that they know, that they feel comfortable with is a really easy way to start. We always want to be sure that we're asking what are your fitness goals, which I'm sure you do. But in addition to that part, we want to ask what are your functional goals? What do you do every day that we can help make better? Okay, got to make it fun. If it's not fun, no one wants to do it. And if it's too much like exercise, it's too much like work. And none of us really want to have to go to work after we've gone to work. And for, right? And, and when we're dealing with teenagers or younger people, school is work. So then asking them to go to school and then come work out and be very regimented, it's not going to be very popular. So making it as fun and as much driven by them as we can is going to be the key thing to look for. OK? All right, that's that part of the pre presentation. Any questions on anything I talked about? Mm -hmm. um, for the, for, um, using like the balls and weights for the exercise, mm -hmm. could you also like just use the resistant band like put them on like a stretching occasion? Yep, yep. We're going to do some things with, with the resistance bands. Another re really nice thing to do is if you have more than one person, if you're working in a small group or a larger group, pair them up with somebody that's going to be slightly motivating 
um, so you got to know the personalities of your people. So if I have somebody who likes to help and I have somebody who needs a little more extra help, I put them together. If I have two competitive people, I'll put them together. And I'll have them work together with the bands because that's going to give them, again, that socialization aspect and then give them a little bit of a um, feel good in terms of, oh, I, I'm going to beat you or, oh, I can help you. So we'll just go over some of the equipment that I have used. Um, hopefully you're all familiar with the physio ball, or now are familiar with what it's called. It's a physio ball, therapy ball. Um, it's useful to have all different sizes. You can use smaller balls for different exercises. You can use larger ones for sitting. Um, I've had people laying on them to do back stretches. Um, we're going to do some leg activities using them against the wall, too. How many of you are familiar with the physio roll? Okay, the physio roll is really nice because while the ball has lots of freedom, the physio roll does not. So if you have somebody who's a little afraid of sitting on a ball or using a ball, the physio roll is nice because it has a nice little divot and then somebody can sit there and they're very secure. Okay, the other thing that's nice about this is you can kind of use it like a pummel. So you could have somebody sitting here and you could be sitting beside them and assisting with different exercises. Okay, if we had a bigger one, I would demonstrate, but this one's a little small. So, so there's that. In terms of using, whoa, promise Cal I won't run you over. Using one of the physio roll balls, is it still going? <laughs> Are you all familiar with the base for the balls? Okay, so again, if you have somebody who is a little leery of being on the ball because of how much freedom it has, you put it on the base, it's not going to go anywhere. So it's nice and stable. Also useful if you don't have a lot of people available for spotting for people who have never been on a ball before. Okay. The other thing that is nice, you're familiar with BOSUs. I use BOSUs a lot. And how many of you are available are familiar with the move and sets? How do you use these? We stand on them. Hey, sit on one. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll grab you one. This is really one of the primary ways to use this. Again, if you have somebody who is not comfortable being on a ball, it's pretty challenging, isn't it? Cool. Yeah, they make the discs, they also make wedges. The wedges are nice because if you have somebody from a postural perspective who tends to roll, the wedges make you sit up nice and tall because of what it does to your pelvis. So the wide part of the wedges and back slopes down front. You can't slump. It's hard to slump on one of these anyway, but people can do it. And then what's nice about the, the discs is you can blow them up to different heights. And if you have somebody who likes to fidget or doesn't pay attention and you're trying to do some sort of discussion, having them sit on that, they're going to get their little fidget out and they're still going to be able to stay focused to you. Okay. You want to make sure that their feet are firmly on the ground when they're using it. But you can do, a, we'll have you do a couple things. I'm not going to, you can, you're, you're, you're good still, Cal. So like when you're sitting on a ball and you can do the rolls, you can do the same thing on the disc. Okay? And try and slump while you're sitting on that. It's very hard to. So that right there gives you a lot of your postural alignment. And I'll often use those with people who, um, who are in wheelchairs. Slip a disc or a wedge under them to give them a little bit more support, especially if they don't have a firm chair. If they have one of the slouchy back chairs and slouchy uh, seats, these are going to be great because it's going to give them a little bit more support. And you can use their foot plates to keep them firmly supported. Um, moving discs, okay, but they're nice. And again, you can do a whole exercise class because I know um, some places, I think Independent Health was doing like the silver sneakers or like chair yoga. Put them on this. They're going to get that much more out of it. Hmm? What's the silver, sneakers? silver sneakers is a exercise based program for younger adults. <laughs> For older young people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, 
So, but this is a really good way to give them that extra, and think about it, just holding yourself in that upright position, how much more, more calories are you burning? You're gonna be breathing better. If we're breathing better, we're gonna be working out better. We're gonna improve our endurance. So lots of great things just from that one simple change, okay? Okay, so there's that. We also have done things with setting up obstacle courses. Um, using simple things like our stepping stones. So challenging balance, having them walk across the different stepping stones to get from one task to another. This can be a major component of an obstacle course or you can use them even to move from one piece of equipment to the other. And they come in all different sizes. Uh, So they come in all different sizes, okay? And the different size challenges them differently, and you can also stack them on top of each other. Okay, so that makes a nice little challenge too, especially for somebody you're working on balance with. Or if you're somebody working with somebody who may tend to get a little distracted, giving them a task to go from one task to another is gonna keep them more on target, okay? All right, Kelly, you wanna come Sit in the chair for me. Do you need help? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Kelly, while we're getting set up, what have you liked about the exercise programs you've been involved in with us? Hopefully you like something. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yes, we always, we every one of our sessions, we had, um, we alternated. We either had a nutrition fact or we had an exercise fact, like ways to increase your endurance every day or how to get incorporate exercise into your everyday activities. So those, and we kept that to 10, 15 minutes, and it was a nice little nugget of information for people to share. Okay. Kelly's a bit of a beast. She likes to work out. And Kelly, Kelly does not accept the word no. Kelly never says, I can't, I won't. Kelly will try everything and anything. And um, she's been really great about pushing herself to that next level. Right? You have been. You've been awesome. Okay. So, again, one of the things we want to be sure of is that we are sitting properly aligned. So I might put Kelly on one of the discs or one of the wedges. Cross legs is not going to fly when we're doing this. <laughs> okay. And we do things, what color do you use, yellow, red, or green? Okay. We can do things on our own or, okay, so I'm going to stabilize for you. Um, let's, why don't you, hmm, I don't know how you guys are going to see. Not an optimal alignment. I would be directly in front of her. But okay, Kelly, row for me. Yes. Yep. So having a workout buddy. Okay. Okay. And then we're going to do your bicep curls. Yep. Okay, good. You can stop with that. Um, we can use the different colored weights. Make sure that we always start lesser, work up to more. And oftentimes what we'll find is that, here Kelly, try that one. Do a bicep curl for me. Pretty easy. Yeah. Okay, try that one. If we start to see that she's losing her postural alignment too much, or we're getting too much movement, it might be too much, or we might just need to give her a little stabilization. So I kind of work up my weights from that aspect. I'm not sure what you guys are doing for that right now. That's good. Okay. Oh, that one's too light. That one's a little too light for you. Try this one. Too heavy? Okay, use the handles. Okay, and we're out and in. Keep your feet on the floor for me, Cal. Out and in. 
Hey, I don't know, do you use a lot of weighted balls in your facilities? Okay, and then go up. Okay, and up, and up. Okay, I'll take that from you. It's very good for abdominals, as long as you're not holding your breath when you're using them. <laughs> and we do a lot of different games, so why don't we move some of this out of the way, and I'm gonna have you guys, they're gonna be in a circle, so I don't know how much, but I'll try and keep a little wider space here. So if you guys wanna come around and we'll make a little circle here, we'll do some activities. Yeah. You're going to sit in your chairs for now. Okay, thank you. So we can do this standing or we can do this sitting. Okay, you're going to pass. So simple group activity just to start getting the core engaged a little bit. Okay, like I said, we can do it, we can alternate people standing versus people sitting. Now we're going to go high, pass it high. <laughs> pass it high. <laughs> Pass it high so we can work on range of motion and then strength is going to be kicked in too. Okay, now you can pass it low. That's what I thought you might like that. <laughs> so again, passing low, we're going to kick in that core a little bit. We want to be sure we're stabilizing. And then you can alternate. So you go low, you go low. Yep. Oh, you want me to go high? Yep. I go low, you go high. So you're changing it out. I've also done a hot potato type play with this. Um, okay, you can, you can stop, Joanne. You can put that one down. <laughs> um, we can also... We can also use the physio ball to do that because we're going to be engaging different muscle, muscles, <laughs> muscles as we're passing it. If you want to get a little bit more active with it, you can tell the participants, okay, squeeze and then pass. So give it a squeeze before you pass. Okay, and then we could even, uh, you want to, this one might be too big for you, Cal, for your feet to start with. Let's try one of the littler ones. So can you move your, put it between your legs? So with your feet, and then you oh. pass with the feet. Oh, I know. Yep, yeah. I don't know if I can do it. Well, let's try. As much as you can try, yep. So again, getting some core, getting, okay. So some things you may not. <laughs> okay, so, so you get the idea. And, and I think sometimes we get a little, I know this is a fizzy bell, we only sit on it. There's so many different things we can do with it. Um, okay, I'm going to be daring here. I won't make you do this one. Does someone want to be daring with me and lay on the floor with me? Sure. Okay. We'll slide. You know what I'm doing with this one, right? <laughs> head to head. Okay. On her back. Okay. okay. And excuse me, I'm going to... Oh. Your, your head can go here to start, like next to me. Next to you? Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. All right. So from here, <laughs> what we're going to do, you ready? I'm ready. Whoop. Nope. Oh, oh, wow. Legs. <laughs> oh, I got to get a little bit closer okay. to you. My legs are a little short. <laughs> but you
but you get the idea. Okay. Yep. And then we and can then do, and then we would pass it back, time. which my legs are a little short and not working well today. No worries. But we could also do that. We can also do that in a circle or, or, hand whoop, hands or, or yeah, or I could do the legs. You could do the hands. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then you put it to your legs. Okay. And then I take it to the hands. Cool. Okay. Very fun. So different ways to work that out. We I've done it with a st like a star shaped circle on so the we're floor. Gonna, when we do our circle, uh, you know, thing. there you go. Okay. But again, hopefully giving you some different ideas of, and yeah. different ways of using things. Yep. How do you use the ball for balance? Like I had this one client, like um, she just wanted to use the ball for balance. Just sitting on the ball is going to be a huge. Kelly, you want to try? Sure. Okay. Okay. So just sitting on the ball, and I'm blocking her so the ball's not going to go anywhere. So just learning to sit on the ball. That's a huge balance thing, huge core. Do gentle bouncing for me, Kel. And what you can do is you have people bounce differently. So they can bounce from their ankles, they can bounce from their waist, they can bounce from their chest. So different ways to activate, you're going to get a different type of bounce. And then, if they're doing well here, you knew I was going to make you more than just sit. Have them do their strength training while they're on that, so they're not thinking about their balance. OK? They can, they can do light bouncing. They can just do sitting, whatever, whatever they're capable of at that point. Okay. <laughs> yeah, normally, normally we would. We would have some music going. But you can have them doing all of the arm exercises. You can have them doing breathing exercises because a lot of our um, clients have breathing issues. So I have them start with their, do you remember how we did the breathing stuff? Start with your hands down. Here, I'll take this. So start with your hands down. And then we're going to breathe in and then breathe out. Okay. Okay, but so cross, so cross, and then head down, and then we're gonna breathe in, and then breathe out, okay? And again, you're gonna get that little extra bit of trunk control, that little trunk engagement, that's gonna be really good, as well as expansion of the lungs, okay? Um, if you wanted to do this like with your person or something, then you could sit on the ball, and how, would you, how could you do like the band exercises? Not, not with that hand, sorry. The one with the handle. Yep, I can get that back out. Do, 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 do. Kelly, you okay over there? Thank you. <laughs> Kelly's pretty, thank you. Kelly's pretty good, though, as long as she's not moving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, somebody want to sit across Kelly? Okay might want to get a little closer and if I'm the trainer working with her I would definitely get closer so my feet are kind of holding on to her feet too and I would have her up like in a corner for a safety perspective one hand one and one okay you're just holding right now Kelly's going to do the rowing and then Kelly you hold them while she rows okay so that's going to activate Kelly. So you can do two people together. You could be one of the people. <laughs> OK? So she's still activating like, her balance. Yep, especially what she's fighting your resistance to keep her upright. And that's why sometimes it might be better to have another client there so that that way the person who might need a little more assistance or stabilization, you can be doing that with them. OK? All right, thank you. Any, yeah, anything. You can use um, free weights, you can use the bands, you can use the tubes, any of that stuff will be, can be used here. Okay. Um, let's see, we can also do things like if we have music going. Okay, start your bouncing a little for me, Cal. And then do one foot up, and then the other foot. So doing marching, 
So we bounce a little to warm up and get activated, and then we can do some marching activities, or we can, while we're trying to do some bounce, have one foot up to get the core working a little bit more, okay? Okay, you need a rest, Kelly, are you okay? Okay, I thought you might. You ready? We're gonna have you sit in the chair. One, two, three. Thank you, ma'am. Um, let's see. The BOSU, I've done the standing on this way on the BOSU. I've done standing on the flat part on the BOSU. BOSU is great for general, um, if you're down on the floor, for doing push-ups against the BOSU or doing upper extremity strengthening on the BOSU by rocking on it. Um, also, a little hard to show on this one but I'll try. If you have a bigger peanut, get somebody down on the floor and have them roll out like this. So you can do your push-ups. You could have them carrying on a conversation. This could be a rest, quote unquote, spot for somebody. And they're still engaging their core depending on how much you have them roll out onto the, onto the peanut. Okay, let's see. We can use the band on a wheelchair also. Just tie off on the foot plates or on the armrest and have people do their exercises, their internal and external rotation, have them do leg exercises the same way. Just have them tie off on the wheelchair or set them up by the equipment and let them do some of the pulley systems. Um, physio ball, also useful to use, to do. Hmm, I don't know how I'm going to show this one. I'm going to come back to this back wall. But just doing this, having them stand there and hold up the ball, you're engaging your core. So if you want to do some explanation for patients about what you're going to be doing next or how we're going to be incorporating things, this is engaging core. You can have them do many squats here. So you're going to get your leg work, your core work. You're going to be doing some chest expansion, depending on where you do the ball, because they can move the ball up more. And have them leaning back against it. I'm going to be getting chest expansion and doing the same thing. OK. Whoopsie. Um, I'm trying to think. Kelly, have I missed anything that we've done in class? Can you think of anything different we've done? Oh, yes, the brakes are on. Yes. Oh, do, yes. I do have one other, one other thing to show you. The hula hoop. Now, I personally can't hula hoop to save my life. I try doing the wee hula hooping and I look ridiculous. I can't even do it on there. But there's some really fun things we can do with the hula hoop. We can line people up. Want to stand up for me? So we can line people up next to each other and then you have to get the hula hoop. You have to figure out how they can pass it. Okay. So you're getting some motor planning. Bring it on back. <laughs> then you can do it. They don't use their hands. So they have to stay touching, but they can't use their hands per se. So you got to think about. <laughs> okay, so you're going to get a little bit more movement out of them. Okay, so ho the hula hoops are great. Um, I've also done things having people stand in a circle holding on to the hula hoop and doing different kicking activities or ball play, that sort of thing, because holding this takes a bit of work, sure. okay? And especially if you're using one of the weighted ones, even more so, okay? Let's see, any questions, any thoughts on how to use equipment differently or any equipment you have that you'd like some input on how to? What is this thing called? Um, a move-in disc, a move-in-sit disc. They, um, they're pretty readily available. Abilitations carries them, pretty reasonably priced. And like I said, the actual disc ones are nice for some people because it makes you sit. Like this, it's more of a challenge where the moving disc um, wedge puts you into that nice anterior uh, pelvic tilt. 
Okay. Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. I have a lot of the people that work in our PT um, department sitting on them if they have back problems because it helps huge. And, and again, if you have fidgeters, so if anybody has kiddos at home or knows somebody in school who's like, oh, can't sit still, right? Those things are really good for that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I avoid lunges. Lunges are, are really not an optimal thing for knees. It puts a lot of stresses on the knees unless you're like training for something specific. If you're just doing general workout, the activity I just showed you at the wall, doing little mini squats. With the ball. Yep, perfect thing to do for somebody with knee because you can work, you work within their available range and their available abilities. So they go down as far as they're comfortable and then they come back up. So you're getting a, a closed chain activity and they're working all the muscles that they need to. So then, um, my mom, I was talking to her and she said that she's fine walking up the stairs, but when she goes down, she just puts pressure on her. Mm-hmm. Does there any workouts she can do? Well, that is one that's going to help from a strength perspective. Um, other things that you kind of have to consider, how strong are their, the front thigh muscles, how strong are the back thigh muscles? Because most people have stronger thigh muscles and in the back than they do in the front. And especially for women, we really don't have the appropriate strength that we need for the front. So another way you can change things up is sitting on the ball, doing your bouncing, and then keep your feet straight versus turn your feet in versus turn your feet out is gonna give you a little bit different area of the quadriceps that you're gonna be working. Well, you want, to, you want to keep the joints moving as much as possible. And Joanne, I'm sure, can attest to this. The more movement you do, the better you're going to be. And even if you have arthritic changes, you want to be sure that you're still moving as much as possible. Because as soon as you stop moving, that's when the joint's going to lock up and you're not going to be able to do anything. So starting off little, working in those small available ranges, just doing weight-bearing things, because that's you're going to be using your own body as resistance, so you're more likely not to hurt yourself if you're doing activities like that. So um, do you know what the Kleenex machine is? It's just like the bands are on a pulley system. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. so would that be good for people with like knee replacement? As long as they're working towards their tolerance. Okay. Yeah. Um, yoga is really good because it gets you moving and it starts you doing those static postures, which is going to challenge you a little bit more um, and really start engaging the muscles nicely. Um, the dance activities are good. I think you enjoyed those too, right? Um, let's see what else. Even doing things with the, with the ball can lay on, the, on your back, on the floor. Right, I can show you some of those too. Going back over here. So even coming here, whoop, and having them here, and just doing pushing from here. So instead of having someone use one of the slide machines, doing it here. It's going to be more to their speed. You can do a single leg one. You can have them walking it up. You can have them walking it down. And that's going to be a really good way to start working into the exercises. You can do the same thing for, for arms, having them walk the ball up the wall, walk the ball down, doing push-ups into the ball. Wall push-ups is another really good thing that people can do. Um, I use the BOSU from an upper extremity perspective, having them do push-offs onto the BOSU. Um, yes, yeah. Uh, trying to think what else. Do either of you ladies have any other ideas for her? Mm hmm Okay. Um, if you get several abdominal surgeries, yep. you can't supposedly exercise your stomach. What can you do? We're always, ex I mean, all of our muscles, if you're standing up, if you're sitting up, you're still engaging. 
Um, but if you've had so many surgeries that you have a lot of scar tissue, so that's going to make that full activation harder. The things that we just talked about against the wall with the ball, because you're going to still have to engage your core a little bit, but you're not working your abdominals per se. You're not doing a sit up. Okay, but that's going to still work the abdominal area, so it's going to help strengthen all the surrounding musculature. Can you be on your knees? Yeah. So like you were doing a push-up, but you're on, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. With cushioning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I know the, the, the floor is a little hard for you. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even sitting on one of the physio balls or sitting on one of the on the discs is going to help activate your abdominals. Okay. Yep. Any other questions? Did I give some ideas that you may not have thought about before? Okay. Mhm. Mm yep. Yep, so you can do your stretching from for everything. So as long as they're balanced on the ball, Kelly, I would make you do this, but so here we can do our, our calf and our hamstring stretching. Um, we do our arm stretching from here. Um, yeah, and this is really nice because, again, you're engaging the core. And if they can't sit on the ball, again, using the disc or putting the ball on one of the bases so they're pretty stable and doing the same thing. The DDPC Inclusive Fitness Initiative grant ended in August 2017. However, Damon's commitment to creating and supporting inclusive fitness opportunities where people with and without disabilities participate together continues. In the final year of the grant, we worked with community-based fitness centers to provide memberships for some of the individuals who participated in our Get Moving group fitness class. Additionally, we have several ways that we will continue our efforts on the Damon College campus. Staff are available to assist fitness professionals through informal consultation on universal design, exercise modification, and inclusive fitness programming. We can also provide additional copies of this video and related materials that we have created. One of our on-campus partners for the grant was the YALT program. Damon's Physical Therapy Program Community Service Committee hosts monthly events that bring together YALT participants and graduate level PT students. They will be adding fitness and wellness activities to the range of activities planned. Finally, we are really excited about a new initiative here on campus through which we will be able to continue our inclusive fitness efforts. Damon Center for Allied and Unified Sport and Exercise, or CAUSE initiative, will enable us to provide athletic-based recreation for individuals with disabilities, family members, and other caregivers. Thank you for taking the time to view this video. Please contact us at the email addresses or telephone numbers provided if we can be of assistance.